Hello and welcome to Maximum Maiden, the first talking book about the band. It was written and researched by Mark Crampton, music is by Amanda Thompson and it's read by Nancy McLean. You can check out our full catalogue on our website at www.chromedreams.co.uk where you can also join our Maximum Collectors Club to receive special offers and free CDs. Alternatively, join the Maximum Collectors Club by filling in the registration form attached to the booklet inside this CD and post it back to us. Probably like 76 and um, through mutual friends, you know, I heard I they were looking for a guitar player and so I was, you know, offered to come down and audition. I met Steve, I thought, you know, when you, you know, you meet some musicians and you go, right, this is it. And I kind of had that always thought, you know, this is going to do something. Often imitated by others, Iron Maiden have been pumping out their wild brand of metallic rock for well over two decades. Best known for such powerful classic hard rock hits such as Run to the Hills, Can I Play with Madness and Bring Your Daughter to the Slaughter, heavy metal rock stalwarts Iron Maiden are one of the most influential groups of the genre. They were amongst the first new bands of their generation to be classified as British metal, following on in the classic tradition of 1970s Brit rock legends such as Black Sabbath, Deep Purple and Led Zeppelin. In fact, one could safely say the Mighty Maiden set the Brit metal scene for the 1980s. Despite their immense commercial success over the years, Iron Maiden have always been something of an underground attraction. Although failing to ever obtain any real mass media attention in America, where critics claim them to be devil-worshipping Satanists due to their dark musical themes and use of the grim mascot Eddie, Maiden still managed to carve a niche for themselves with no less than five consecutive million-selling albums. They also became well-known throughout the rest of the world and have remained consistently popular during their long career. Maiden's no-holds-barred, take-no-prisoners attitude has served them well. Every one of their 12 studio albums and three live albums to date have been major top 10 successes, both at home in the UK and in more than 25 other countries around the world. The band have also chalked up over 20 hit singles, a fact that sometimes gets overlooked as so few of them have ever been played on commercial radio. The story of Iron Maiden officially began back in 1971, when a 15-year-old youth by the name of Steve Harris, inspired by the likes of progressive rockers such as Wishbone Ash, Jethro Tull and Early Genesis, bought a copy Telecaster bass for the then princely sum of £40. Harris had previously harboured ambitious visions of one day playing professional soccer for his beloved West Ham FC and was actually signed to them on schoolboy forms. However, the talent pool in the Hammers youth organisation in those days was overflowing and the number of players who actually made it into the professional game were very few. The continuous playing and training regime also meant that the young Harris couldn't join his mates down at the pub in drinking, watching bands and pulling birds. After thinking long and hard, Harris eventually abandoned hopes of a soccer career and grew to have a strong liking and knowledge of rock music. He taught himself how to play bass guitar by strumming along to his favourite records and jamming with his friends. This led to the formation of a band called Influence, who then changed their name to Gypsy's Kiss. Gypsy's Kiss made their live debut at a local talent contest in Poplar, East London. They lasted all of six gigs before eventually calling it a day. Harris, now fired by a burning musical desire, hooked up with a pub rock band called Smiler. While the other band members were several years older than he was, the bassist picked up some valuable experience, but still felt musically stifled. Smiler were a good time boogie band and made it clear that they didn't expect their new bass player to leap around the stage and write songs. By the end of 1975, Harris was beginning to realise that the only way to do what he wanted to do was to put his own rock combo together. In the spring of 1976, his new band secured a residency at the Cart and Horses pub in Stratford in the capital's East End. It was the first of what would be a host of local gigs the group would continue to play over the next two years, in the process honing their self-written, uncompromising, loud, intense, power-driven rock style. The first couple of gigs went okay, but Harris felt there was still something missing. 
vocalist Paul Day was replaced by ex Smiler songsmith Dennis Wilcock, and in turn he recommended a talented young lead rhythm guitarist by the name of Dave Murray. Resident guitarists Terry Rance and Paul Sullivan took it as an insult to their talent and shortly departed. Bob Sawyer, who used the name Bob D'Angelo, was recruited as second guitarist, and with Ron Rebel on drums, the first proper lineup of the band came into being. The concept of Iron Maiden was born, and ironically, as the years passed by, Harris would be the only original member to remain in future lineups. The name of the band came to Harris when he watched the old cult black and white classic movie, The Man in the Iron Mask. An Iron Maiden was a medieval instrument of torture, a metal coffin with spikes on the inside where the victims were placed inside and skewered to death. As well as the cart and horses residency, the band soon began to get gigs all over East London, building up a strong local following in the process. After six months, the lineup changed again. D'Angelo left, as instead of trying to complement Murray's guitar, he kept trying to compete with him, a strict no contest. Then, after a row at the Bridge House pub in Canning Town, vocalist Dennis Wilcock took it upon himself to fire Murray, who in turn went off to join Urchin, a group featuring a young guitar man by the name of Adrian Smith. With all the inherent six-string hassles, the band decided to temporarily abandon the twin guitar concept. Terry Wapram joined as sole guitarist and Tony Moore was recruited on keyboards. Drummer Ron Rebel decided he couldn't handle the aggravation and left to be replaced by Barry Perkis, who would later call himself Thunderstick. The new lineup played one gig at the Bridge House and it was painfully obvious that keyboards were not the answer. Exit Moore, followed by Wapram, who claimed he couldn't play without keyboards. Harris went down to an urchin gig and persuaded Murray to rejoin the maiden fold. However, when Wilcock and Thunderstick decided to up and go, things began to look pretty bleak for the fledgling lineup. Not to be deterred, Harris recruited ex Smiler drummer Doug Sampson alongside himself and Murray, and while the three of them rehearsed, they looked for a new singer. appreciate success more when you you know when you're not so much in demand and you, you can't get a lot of work and you know not, I think when you do get success you appreciate it more, you know eventually a mate of Steve Harris recommended a singer by the name of Paul Diano Diano passed his audition with flying colors and the new look maiden set about their comeback things were difficult at first as in 1977, the punk New Wave revolution was in full swing and most live venues were only booking punk acts. The record companies felt the same. The group did receive offers, but only if they were prepared to cut their hair and go punk rock. Determined to keep the heavy metal cause alive in the face of the new punk music movement, the group undertook regular stints at London pubs, the Bridge House in Canning Town and the Ruskin Arms in Manor Park. Yet despite the constant gigging, they were still unable to elicit the right record company interest. By late 1978, having established a strong local cult following, they realised that they needed a demo tape. So on December the 30th, Maiden went into Spacewood Studios near Cambridge and forked out £200 to record four tracks, Prowler, Invasion, Strange World and Iron Maiden. Financially, the band were almost broke, they couldn't even afford to buy the original master tapes of the session. 1979 didn't get off to a good start, when in February the group had £12,000 worth of equipment stolen from their van. A local lad was eventually convicted of the theft, and most of the equipment was returned. Furthermore, when Maiden went back to Spaceward Studios to pay for the tape and mix, the tape had been wiped, leaving them with just the cassettes from the original session, unedited and unmixed. Guitarist Dave Murray gave his copy of the tape to Neil Kay, a DJ with a passionate love of hard rock music, who held regular rock nights at the Sound House, which adjoined the Bandwagon Pub in Kingsbury, North London. Kay played the tape at one of his Sound House nights and was astonished at the crowd's reaction.
the tape instantly became a massive heavy metal club hit. It was the most requested item for months, and Maiden subsequently became a regular live attraction at the Soundhouse over the next 12 months. In May 1978, Kay organised the Heavy Metal Crusade at London's Music Machine in Camden. Iron Maiden appeared as special guests to Motorhead, who were playing under the name of Iron Fist and the Hordes from Hell. This gig was later recognised that summer as the first concert of the new wave of British heavy metal, a phrase coined by Sounds journalist and future Kerrang! editor Jeff Barton. Before the year was out, the band would play the music machine twice more, as headliners. During that fateful summer of 1978, the band's demo tape also came to the attention of Rod Smallwood of the MAM agency. A rugby mate of Smallwood's, who also worked with Maiden bassist Steve Harris, had passed the tape on. After listening to it and checking the band out, Smallwood offered his services as their manager. He invited the fledgling Maiden to play at the Windsor Castle and the Swan pubs before subsequently booking a series of gigs all over the UK to allow the band to build up a nationwide following. He also arranged dates in or near central London to get record companies to check out the group. One such gig was a sold-out showcase at the Marquee Club in central London on October 13, 1978, a concert that was ignored by just about every major label except for EMI Records. The following month, deluged with requests for copies of their demo tape, the band decided to put it out on their own rock-hard label. The seven-inch EP was christened The Soundhouse Tapes, and to keep it special for their hardcore fans, it was only sold at gigs and by mail order. The 6,000 copies sold out almost immediately, making it an instant collector's item. Despite requests from major music stores for the record, the band decided to keep it as something special for their growing fan base. Needless to say, on November 28, 1978, EMI Records signed up Iron Maiden to their roster of rock acts. In between gigs, the band went into EMI's Manchester Square Studios to record two further tracks, Sanctuary and Rothschild, for a new wave of British heavy metal compilation album being put together entitled Metal for Mothers and released through EMI Records. They also recorded four songs for Radio 1's The Friday Rock Show. To augment the lineup, Tony Parsons came in as second guitarist to make the band a five-piece again. Over the Christmas New Year period, the band underwent even more lineup changes. Doug Sampson quit for health reasons, and Parsons, who always appeared to be bored on stage, got the elbow. Clive Burr and Dennis Stratton took over on drums and guitar respectively. The band then got down to the arduous business of recording their first album, with Will Malone in the producer's chair. I just take each day at a time. I try not to. I'm aware of what's happening or what's supposed to be happening for a long period of time in, in the future, but um, I don't sit and plan and go, how many days till I go home? You know, because that's the way that you end up turning into a lunatic. In February 1980, while the band were out on the Metal for Mothers tour to promote the compilation, their first single, Running Free, was released. Despite receiving almost no radio airplay whatsoever, it totally exceeded record company expectations, leaping into the UK charts at number 34. When the band were then offered an invitation to appear on BBC One's Top of the Pops, the UK's biggest weekly TV chart show, Maiden refused to do it unless they were allowed to play live. This was something no artist had done on the show since The Who had unceremoniously demolished the studio during a performance some eight years earlier. The BBC execs were sceptical, but surprisingly relented, and Iron Maiden thus became the first act to play live on the show since that fateful Who appearance. Such precocity was rewarded when their self-titled debut album, Iron Maiden, was released a few weeks later on April 14th, and immediately rocketed straight into the UK album's chart at number four. Although the band's uncompromisingly raw debut album release had been recorded in a hurry, 
it was nonetheless a hit in Britain due to the success of their debut single. Maiden, who had followed promoting Metal for Mothers with a guest slot on the Judas Priest British Steel UK tour, began their own fully-fledged headline UK tour playing some 40-odd dates in just under two months. They also appeared again at the Marquee for a run of four consecutive nights, all totally sold out. A second single, Sanctuary, reached UK number 29 in June 1980. On its sleeve, Derek Riggs, the group's resident designer, depicted Iron Maiden's psychotic mechanical mascot, Eddie, knife-slashing Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher. After legal action was threatened, her eyes were blacked out. To celebrate the group's success, EMI held a special Iron Maiden party at Madame Tussauds' Chamber of Horrors as a prelude to a gig at the Rainbow Theatre, Finsbury Park in North London. In August, the band were featured on ITV's 20th Century Box special on the new wave of British heavy metal as they embarked on their first ever European tour supporting US megastars KISS. They returned to the UK on August the 23rd to play at the Reading Festival on the Saturday night as special guests to UFO, giving bassist Steve Harris the opportunity to play on the same bill as UFO's Pete Way, one of his all-time heroes. On returning from the KISS tour in October, second guitarist Dennis Stratton left the Maiden ranks due to ongoing musical differences. Stratton's taste in music was quite different from the rest of the band, and his ideas had not been in line with where the band wanted to go. A parting of the ways was inevitable. His replacement came in the shape of ex-urchin guitar man Adrian Smith, whom the band had actually approached to join Maiden before Stratton joined the ranks. November 1980 saw the group release a second single, Women in Uniform, which climbed to UK number 35. It spawned a picture sleeve again featuring Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher, this time holding a machine gun, waiting for revenge on Eddie. The Maiden mascot had by now been introduced as a permanent feature of the band's live set and would be destined to grow in physical and popular stature over the coming years. A mini UK tour was hastily arranged to break Adrian Smith into the Maiden fold. The band then began work on a new studio album with Martin Birch producing. They broke off from recording to return to London's Rainbow Theatre to play a special Christmas gig, which was filmed for future live video release. The Capacity crowd were given an early Christmas present when the second half of the show had to be played all over again due to problems with the sound recording. Let's just say nobody left early. Iron Maiden were now at the forefront of the new wave of British heavy metal, the short-lived media-led phenomenon that would propel them onto the world stage. It was a genre that the band had almost single-handedly reinvented for the 1980s. Iron Maiden's follow-up second album, Killers, came out on February the 28th, 1981. Displaying a harder approach to proceedings than its predecessor, it charted in the UK at number 12. March saw the single Twilight Zone Rothschild make UK number 31 as the band began to earn themselves gold album discs in several major territories, thanks in part to a hefty touring schedule. In May, Maiden embarked on their first ever world tour. Christened the Killer World Tour, it saw the band playing in 15 countries, including Yugoslavia, where they became the first ever rock band to perform. It also saw them take in first-time visits to Canada, Japan and America, making their US debut again opening for metal stalwarts Judas Priest. In America, the Killers album made the US Hot 100 charting at number 78, while in the UK, another single release, Purgatory, made number 52 in the summer of 1981. As the Killer tour came to an end that September, it was clear that singer Paul Diano's days were numbered. Due to an uncontrollable alcohol addiction, he was forced to part company with the group. Diano had believed in living the rock and roll lifestyle to the full, despite warnings from the rest of the band, their management and doctors, damaging his vocal cords and his health in the process. He had also begun to turn away from the out-and-out -out hard rock played by Maiden and towards a bluesier, white snake-like style of metal. The ousted Maiden singer would eventually continue his career with Lone Wolf and Battlezone, and he later formed his own rock outfit with the apt name of Killers. To neatly wrap up proceedings, 
the band released the live EP Made in Japan, featuring performances recorded earlier that year alongside a 30-minute video of the group's Rainbow Christmas show. While the band searched for a new Voxman, Made in Japan kept up their media profile, neatly hitting UK number 43 and US number 89. Once more, a replacement was close at hand. Bruce Bruce, the vocalist of fellow British rockers Samson, had become disenchanted with the band's drift towards the kind of music that, ironically, Diano was now embracing, and so he auditioned for Maiden in October 1981. He was accepted and reverted to his normal name of Bruce Dickinson. Private school educated, Dickinson had been raised from the age of four in Sheffield, Yorkshire. He had spent a short time in the infantry before going to Queen Mary's College London to study history. After playing with the group's speed and shots, he was seen by two members of Sampson, singing in the Prince of Wales pub in Gravesend, Kent. He was invited to join, and after finishing his history degree examinations in the summer of 1979, he had become the group's lead singer. A few hastily arranged warm-up dates in Italy in November introduced Dickinson to Iron Maiden and the sceptical media. When he made a triumphant UK live debut at the Rainbow, the band took the opportunity to play some new songs currently being recorded for their new album. The year ended with Iron Maiden returning to the Ruskin Arms pub under the thinly disguised alter ego of Genghis Khan to play a combined charity and Dave Murray birthday bash. Media and fans were instantly taken aback by Dickinson's powerful vocal delivery and duly christened him the Air Raid Siren. I'd like to think we were too sensible for anything else like that to happen. After having done this amount of touring for this amount of time, if we haven't turned into drug-crazed lunatics by now, I don't think we ever will. And I drink, and uh, I drink a lot of tea as well. If 1981 could be viewed as a successful year for Maiden, then 1982 exceeded all expectations. The band were already engaged in their sell-out British leg of the Beast on the Road tour when the first single from the new album, Run to the Hills, gave the band their first UK top 10 hit when it reached number 7 in the charts in March 1982. The video to the song even managed to get aired on US MTV. The new Maiden album, The Number of the Beast, simply blew away the competition to enter the UK chart at number 1 that April, knocking Barbara Streisand off the top spot. Produced again by Martin Birch, this groundbreaking, legendary release would soon come to be known as one of the greatest rock recordings of all time. The Beast on the Road tour lived up to its name, with a band playing a gruelling 180 dates in 16 countries over eight months to over one million fans. As the album's title track hit UK number 18 in May, success was mirrored across Europe. Canada and also in the American charts where the song's parent album reached number 33. Stateside, the number of the beast would have a 65-week chart run and earn the band a gold disc. Once again, Iron Maiden broke new ground as they performed shows in Australia and New Zealand for the first time and played their first sold-out headline gig in the US at New York's Palladium, where a now larger-than-life 12-foot Eddie held aloft the bitten-off head of Ozzy Osbourne. Such was his enthusiasm that new singer Bruce Dickinson was forced to wear a surgical collar for some of the gigs, the result of too much headbanging. The summer of 1982 proved to be quite eventful. In July, a soccer match with German metalers the Scorpions ended in a nil-nil tie, while in August, the band broke off from their US tour and flew back to the UK to make a one-off performance at the annual Reading Rock Festival in front of 35,000 fans. It all proved a portent of things to come. The gruelling world tour schedule Iron Maiden had embarked on eventually took its toll. Once again, there was another casualty in the Maiden lineup. In January 1983, the band's drummer Clive Burr left the group amicably to be replaced by ex-streetwalkers, trust skinsman, Nico McBrain, an all-round headcase whose pranks would become infamous as the years went by. 
The group had originally met Nico during the UK leg of their 1981 Killer World Tour, when he played with French rockers Trust, who had supported Maiden. With personal problems rectified, the band immediately flew to Nassau in the Bahamas, where they had recently relocated for tax purposes, to give their new drummer his baptism of fire as they set about recording their next album, Peace of Mind. Since the unexpected worldwide success of The Number of the Beast had made Maiden international rock superstars, the band changed very little of their style for the Peace of Mind record. They took time out from recording to film a promo video for the forthcoming single Flight of Icarus. The script called for someone to wear blue makeup and dress in monk's robes, and Nico McBrain as the new boy volunteered for the role. In May 1983, Flight of Icarus peaked at UK number 11, while Peace of Mind went straight into the UK album's countdown at number 3, as Maiden began their World Peace Tour at Hull City Hall. The four-month World Peace Tour was once again a global affair, with the band achieving major status throughout the countries where they played. In America, where Peace of Mind made the top 20 peaking at number 14, the band were branded Satanists by a small group of ill-informed, self-opinionated individuals. Their accusations, totally untrue, only served to gain the band more publicity, pushing the album's sales into platinum status. As before, there was to be no let-up in pace, and Maiden found themselves playing to larger and larger audiences, selling out everywhere and gathering more momentum in the US with their first ever full-scale arena headline tour. The World Peace Tour came to an end in front of a European-wide TV audience in Dortmund, Germany. As a climax to the show, the band viciously attacked the walking Eddie. Apparently, they had been having thoughts about dispensing with the services of their monster mascot, but fortunately the reports of Eddie's demise were grossly exaggerated and he was to be back on record covers and stages the following year. 1983 had proved to be a very good year for Iron Maiden, while another single release, The Trooper, made UK Top 20, readers of UK heavy metal bible Kerrang! voted Peace of Mind and The Number of the Beast the top two heavy metal albums of all time. And on a personal level, for football-mad bassist Steve Harris, the Maiden soccer squad had also managed to beat fellow Brit metalers Def Leppard 4-2. Brazilian fans do have a real commitment to things which goes way beyond just being, uh, you know, like commercial, you know. It's not like it's just something they read about in a magazine. It's something they're passionate about for their entire lives. Iron Maiden went into 1984 with a stable lineup, facing the prospect of their busiest year yet. It opened with a confident, but not complacent, Iron Maiden, having a three-week break before starting work on another studio album. It was rehearsed in Jersey and once again recorded in Nassau. As Two Minutes to Midnight, the first single from the new album, made number 11 in the UK in August 1984, the group's groundbreaking World Slavery Tour began, set to push the band's boundaries ever onwards. They opened the tour in Poland, the first time a major band had taken a full Western stage rock production behind the Iron Curtain. The band also played in Hungary and Yugoslavia as their Iron Maiden Behind the Iron Curtain trek became a huge success and earned the attention of the world's media. In those days, with the Iron Curtain still firmly in place, a tour of those countries was a hefty undertaking for any act. The whole tour was also filmed for a documentary which was released later in the year as Behind the Iron Curtain. From Eastern Europe, the band returned via Italy to the UK in September to kick off the British leg of the World Slavery Tour at the Apollo Theatre in Glasgow. Simultaneously, the Power Slave album hit the streets and went straight into the album charts at number two. The album featured some elaborate artwork and the band's massive stage show reflected this. Eddie, the band's hugely popular mascot and icon, had now been transformed from a walk-on puppet to a huge 20-foot mechanised monster. 
At the end of the 24-date UK leg of the World Slavery Tour in October, the group played four sell-out dates at London's Hammersmith Odeon. In November, the extracted single, Aces High, peaked at UK number 20, while the Power Slave album pushed its way up to US number 21. The group found themselves breaking records everywhere. They interrupted the US leg of the tour and made their first ever visit to South America, playing the Rock in Rio Festival to an estimated 200,000 fans. Maiden also sold out Radio City Music Hall in New York five nights running, illness preventing it from reaching seven, and in March 1985 they became first act ever to sell out Long Beach Arena in Southern California for four consecutive nights, playing to a total audience of 52,000. The Long Beach shows were filmed with a view to releasing a live video and live album, capturing the band at their very best. It marked the highlight of the tour, which then continued throughout Southeast Asia. Following some 200 shows, the band's world slavery trek came to an exhausting conclusion in July 1985, with a British Independence Day celebration concert. The world slavery tour had been an overwhelming success for Iron Maiden. The band were at the height of their powers, their stage show was awesome and the merchandise receipts broke records at many venues. The product of Power Slave's 11-month, 26-country world tour was Live After Death, a double live album and video. Released in October 1985, it featured all of Maiden's biggest hit singles to date. The extracted live single versions of Running Free and Run to the Hills both made the UK top 30. Live After Death charted in the UK at number 2 and number 19 in the US, while the accompanying video went to number 1 in the British video charts and remained the best-selling music video for months. With the release of these two live offerings, the band could at last take their first real holiday for five years and they needed it. They took a well-earned rest, albeit with a return home in December to play a gig at London's Marquee Club, billed as the entire population of Hackney. With the release of Live After Death, an opus regarded by many as one of the best live rock albums of all time, Iron Maiden had firmly established themselves as a powerful and unique metal band. Their long-awaited sixth studio long player, Somewhere in Time, was released in September 1986. It charted in the UK at number three and went gold or platinum in every major territory, including the US, where it went to number 11. This time recorded in both Nassau and Munich, Somewhere in Time marked a bit of a departure in the band's style from their past heavy metal releases, showcasing the inclusion of synthesizer guitars and keyboards for the very first time. But it in no way diluted Maiden's classic metallic style. Any fans who feared it would water down Maiden's music needed only to listen to the likes of Heaven Can Wait or Alexandra the Great. The first single released off the record, Wasted Years, a track written about the rigours of their previous tours, reached the UK Top 20. To promote their sixth studio release, Iron Maiden went somewhere on tour again, kicking off with a visit behind the Iron Curtain in Eastern Europe, commencing in Belgrade. In November 1986, as the track Stranger in a Strange Land reached UK number 22, the band performed a charity benefit gig with special guests, the heavy metal pastiche combo Bad News, as part of their six-night sellout stint at London's Hammersmith Odeon. Again, Maiden's live show was a dazzling spectacle. The highlight of the show featured Eddie, this time around in the form of an understage giant inflatable cyborg, lifting the entire band off the stage into the air with his two clawed hands and sending Nico McBrain's drum kit skyward, balanced on his head as the gig climaxed. The spring of 1987 was spent on another successful American tour. The eight-month Somewhere on Tour extravaganza eventually wound up in Osaka, Japan in May. As a testament to their recent touring outing, the band were filmed and interviewed for a video documentary released later in 1987 entitled 12 Wasted Years. The video chronicled their rise to the top, featuring previously unseen archive footage and interviews with key people involved in the Iron Maiden story. With the tour successfully completed, it was time to start thinking about yet another record.
I think in America, if you went to play a small stadium, people would genuinely, a small theatre, people would genuinely think you were mad. For a start, if there are 10,000 people in Denver on the CRM maybe, and you announce one concert in a 3,000 seat theatre, there's going to be 6,000 people going to wreck the theatre because they can't get in. That is not the way to go and play Denver. Released in April 1988, Iron Maiden's seventh studio album, the aptly titled Seventh Son of a Seventh Son, was an epic masterpiece. It marked the first time that Iron Maiden had ever recorded a concept album. This wasn't the idea at the outset, but as the band wrote and rehearsed, the material seemed to be linked by a common theme running throughout. Derek Riggs' cover artwork also showed a marked change, being more subdued in style than anything previously seen. The album entered the UK chart at number one and peaked at US number 12, while the record's lead single, Can I Play With Madness, hit UK number three. Both achievements confirming Maiden's position as Britain's premier metal act. Press-wise, Seventh Son of a Seventh Son became Iron Maiden's most critically acclaimed album since Number of the Beast. It was also to spawn further UK top 10 singles, again quite a feat without any major radio support. The seventh tour of a seventh tour also broke with Maiden tradition, beginning in America and being made up of a combination of arena and festival dates. The second single release from the album, The Evil That Men Do, hit UK number five as the band in the midst of their seventh tour world trek made a one-off UK appearance on August the 20th, 1988 to headline the legendary Monsters of Rock Festival held annually at Castle Donington. It proved to be the high spot of the tour. Supported by one of the strongest bills ever seen at the festival, Kiss, David Lee Roth, Megadeth, Guns N' Roses and label mates Halloween all appeared. Iron Maiden appeared before an all-time record-breaking crowd of 102,000 fans. They played a blistering set, and the stage show was as awe-inspiring as ever, climaxing with a massive fireworks display. The band then took their Monsters of Rock festival shows to Europe in September, where they had repeated success, most notably when the band played a further Monsters concert at the Wilhelm II Stadium in Tilburg, West Germany. Maiden continued back to the UK, where the record's third single, The Clairvoyant, had hit UK number six to complete the tour on home territory with a series of sell-out arena shows at Wembley Arena and the Birmingham NEC. This marked the very first time that the band had played such large-scale venues in the UK. The two nights at Birmingham NEC, arguably the best non-festival shows of the tour, were filmed for a proposed live video, which would be co-directed and edited by Steve Harris. The tour came to an end on 12th of December, when the group played four nights at London's Hammersmith Odeon, the scene of so many previous Iron Maiden triumphs. With no album scheduled for 1989, the group were able to look forward to a real break to recharge their batteries and spend some real time with their families. They had previously decided to take the whole of 1989 off, However, Voxman Bruce Dickinson and guitarist Adrian Smith rested by recording their first solo albums, while bassist Steve Harris spent most of his time editing the Birmingham footage of the band from the NEC. In April 1989, Dickinson, a keen fencer and swordsman, was ranked seventh in Great Britain in the domestic rankings for men's foil. His team, the Hemel Hempstead Fencing Club, became national champions and went to Paris to represent Great Britain in the European Cup. The maiden singer also had one of his proposed solo songs, Bring Your Daughter to the Slaughter, featured in the movie A Nightmare on Elm Street 5, The Dream Child. The band members did finally team up together again in November 1989 for the launch of the live video Maiden England, as an extracted live version of Infinite Dreams hit number six in the UK. EMI and Maiden's Management Sanctuary threw a lavish launch party with a strong British theme in a hall decked out with Union Jacks. The invited representatives of the world's media dined on fish and chips and drank bitter, while the band spent their time being photographed and interviewed. Like its predecessor, Live After Death, the Maiden England celluloid once again proved to be a bestseller amongst music videos. 
In December, Dickinson collaborated with Ian Gillen, Brian May and Robert Plant on Rock Aid Armenia for a remake of the deep purple classic Smoke on the Water. This was a UK top 40 hit, with all profits from the record going to the victims of the recent Armenian earthquake disaster. In January 1990, the band assembled at Steve Harris's studio to start work on a new record. Work had barely begun when, for the first time in seven years, there was a personnel change. Maiden guitar man Adrian Smith revealed that he wasn't sure that he could still give the band 100%, and so, by mutual consent, he left and went on to form his own rock outfit, ASAP. Fortunately, a solution was once again close at hand. Ex-Gillen and White Spirit guitarist Yannick Gares was well known to the band, having recently worked the previous summer with Bruce Dickinson on the singer's forthcoming solo album. After auditioning, he was invited to join the Maiden ranks. While they got down to the arduous process of recording their new album with their new recruit, EMI Records made the decision to remarket the band's back catalogue in a rather ingenious way to celebrate 10 years of their recording career with the label. Between the middle of February until the end of April 1990, EMI released two 12-inch singles as a double-package mini-album consecutively every week for 10 weeks. A limited edition of 10 such releases began with 1980's Running Free, coupled with Sanctuary, right through to recent live versions of The Clairvoyant and Infinite Dreams, the majority of which went top 10 in the UK album charts. The spring of 1990 saw the release of Bruce Dickinson's long-awaited debut solo opus, Tattooed Millionaire, co-written with new Iron Maiden recruit guitarist Yannick Gares. Simultaneously, Sidgwick and Jackson published Dickinson's first ever novel, The Adventures of Lord Iffy Boatrace. On the back of his success with Maiden, both the album and its title track made the UK top 20. He then took to the road in the summer of 1990, including a seven-date UK solo tour kicking off at the Mayfair Newcastle and finishing up at London's Astoria Theatre as his cover version of Mott the Hoople's All the Young Dudes reached UK number 23. A 25-date US tour followed suit, with a gig at the Whiskey in Los Angeles as Tattooed Millionaire climbed into the Billboard Hot 100 album charts. Back in Britain, a live version of Dickinson's solo track, Dive, 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 recorded at the London Astoria gig, made the UK top 50. We never really bothered about doing anything for money anyway, so we, well, we do make money, but I'm not entirely sure how. The financial aspect of it um, doesn't, doesn't worry me, I'm not, I'm not that greedy. With new guitarist Yannick Gers on board, the recording of the new Maiden album continued on schedule. For the first time since Number of the Beast, the band recorded on home soil at Steve's own studio in a converted barn on the side of his house in Essex. Having been away from treading the boards for almost two years, the band were raring to get out and play live again. Thus, the No Prayer on the Road tour got underway with a secret gig in Milton Keynes on 19th of September 1990. The following night, Iron Maiden officially embarked on the first leg of their world tour at the Mayflower Theatre in Southampton. After the mammoth productions of the group's previous tours, it was a back-to-basics approach this time around, with a minimum of stage set and lighting. It ably demonstrated that Maiden could put on a great show in their own right, without having to be surrounded by megawatts of sound and big-budget production lighting effects. New recruit Yannick Gares also made a big difference live. His high-energy enthusiasm and on-stage antics rubbed off on everyone, especially fellow guitarist Dave Murray. The band and their fans enjoyed being close to each other again, feeding off each other's enthusiasm in a way reminiscent of the earlier days in the band's career. While Maiden were out on the first leg of their No Prayer for the Road UK tour, the track Holy Smoke from the forthcoming studio album hit UK number three. Released in October 1990, 
The group's new long player, No Prayer for the Dying, debuted at UK number two, behind Luciano Pavarotti, Placido Domingo and Jose Carreras in concert. No Prayer for the Dying was a record that returned to the classic sound the group had used when recording their first releases. The content of the album took on a more serious feel as the band's lyrics began to deal with more contemporary issues. The album cover and packaging artwork also had a much more sinister look about it. Traditionally, Maiden's initial 21-date UK trek wound up once again on October the 18th at London's Hammersmith Odeon, prior to the band kicking off their 55-date No Prayer for the Road European tour in Barcelona, Spain. With No Prayer for the Dying making the US top 20 and earning itself gold status in America, Maiden seemed to be nicely back on track. They returned to the UK in December for a stint of brief seasonal British shows, including two nights at London's Wembley Arena during what was billed as their No Prayer for Christmas UK tour. One of the album's singles, Bring Your Daughter to the Slaughter, a song originally written by Dickinson for his debut solo record, was granted the Golden Raspberry Award for Worst Song of the Year. It nonetheless gave Iron Maiden their first elusive UK chart-topping hit when it debuted straight in at number one in January 1991. EMI were criticised by the media for the cynical ploy of marketing several formats of the release which they knew die-hard Maiden fans would immediately buy in quantity, thus boosting the sales performance of the record during a traditionally weak sales period after Christmas. The band's No Prayer on the Road world tour ended in March 1991, when they completed their 33-date US jaunt. The No Prayer tour was originally scheduled to carry on to Japan and Australia, but the travel and shipping difficulties presented by the outbreak of the Gulf War brought about its premature end, leaving Maiden with little to do than take a well-earned break during the summer of 1991. As the RIAA certified platinum sales of previous Maiden releases, Live After Death and Power Slave, the band was featured in a Department of Transportation and Advertising Council ad with crash test dummies Vince and Larry. Elsewhere, drummer Nico McBrain and bassist Steve Harris cropped up on a version of rock and roll alongside former Who frontman Roger Daltrey, ASAP guitarist Andy Barnett and world tennis stars turned guitar slingers John McEnroe and Pat Cash. The group began work in January 1992 on their follow-up album at Harris's home Barnyard Studio. By April, with recording complete, vocalist Bruce Dickinson started on a second solo album at London's Battery Studios with producer Chris Sangarides. Dickinson had now become something of a metal celebrity in media circles as a reworking of Alice Cooper's I Want to Be Elected, cut with comic actor Rowan Atkinson in the guise of Mr Bean, hit UK Top 10. Released in May 1992, Fear of the Dark was to be the group's 20th UK chart album and third chart topper spurred on by the success of the record's lead cut Be Quick or Be Dead, which debuted at its UK number two peak behind Right Said Fred's Deeply Dippy. The album also debuted in the US at number 12 and in time was to become one of their biggest selling to date. When it came time to thinking about the new album, the band and management had decided that Eddie needed to be radically transformed for the 1990s. From comic book horror, it was decided that Eddie should be more straightforward horror, and to that end, several artists were invited to submit ideas of how they saw the new Eddie. Eventually, a more sinister design, submitted by illustrator Melvin Grant, was selected. Thus, Fear of the Dark was to be the first Iron Maiden album not to feature an illustrious cover painting by longtime Maiden artist Derek Riggs. The band's traditional album release accompanying world tour kicked off in June 1992 when the group played before 400 fans at the Oval Pub in Norwich, billed as the Nodding Donkeys. With an elaborate stage show, the Fear of the Dark global trek got into gear as the band hit the road again, starting this time in Iceland. Maiden then proceeded to the US, where the North America leg began before a sellout crowd at the Ritz Theatre in New York. In America, the band had the accolade of having another one of their previous platters, Somewhere in Time, certified platinum by the RIAA. Back in the UK in July, another single cut, From Here to Eternity, reached UK Top 30. The South American leg of the Fear of the Dark World Tour 
saw Iron Maiden and EMI label mates Thunder perform at the Pacaiombo Stadium, Sao Paulo, Brazil in early August. However, things didn't all go their way that summer. The group were banned from playing in Santiago, Chile, after the Catholic Church pronounced them devils and Satanists. They also lost a soccer match, 6-5, to EMI music executives at EMI's Latin American conference in Buenos Aires, Argentina. Again, Maiden were given the opportunity to play at the annual Monsters of Rock Festival at Castle Donington. On August 22, 1992, the group headlined a bill featuring The Almighty, Skid Row, Slayer, Thunder and Wasp before a 62,000 capacity crowd. The band played an even stronger show than in 1998. They knew what to expect this time around and were less affected by nerves. The stage show was more elaborate, although not to the excess of 1998, with Eddie appearing as a giant tree creature as per the album cover. While the entire show was broadcast live by Radio 1 as part of their 25th anniversary celebrations, Maiden decided to have the event filmed for posterity. Along with their prestigious return to the Donington stage, the summer of 1992 also saw Maiden taking large-scale European dates at Mannheim Maymarkt Galanda in West Germany when they participated in Super Rock 92 with Black Sabbath. Then there was a further Monsters of Rock festival at the Hippodrome de Vincennes outside Paris, with both shows taped for a possible future live album. Finishing in Japan in November, the band returned home unaware of the lurking bombshell that was about to be dropped upon them. I met, uh, I met the guys when uh, Wolfsbane had a chance to uh, support Maiden on, uh, on the UK tour and I suppose getting into the soccer team, soccer team, you know, did me a bit of good and um, I don't know and then I think they kind of saw what I was up to and I think Steve had heard me not just on the stage but warming up backstage and uh, saw something there in my voice that he liked and I think that uh, when they wanted to audition for new singers they asked me to come along. In March 1993, long-time Maiden frontman Bruce Dickinson expressed his desire to leave the group on a permanent basis to pursue a solo career at the end of the band's forthcoming live commitments. In truth, Dickinson had been thinking for some time about leaving Iron Maiden. Always a workaholic, he had several projects on the go outside of the band and with a young family the demands on his time were reaching saturation point. Something had to give and the singer felt he'd gone as far as he could with Iron Maiden. As a tribute to the band's legacy, with Dickinson, two live albums were slated for release in 1993, both recorded on the band's recent world concert trek the previous year. It had been decided that rather than release a double live album as they'd done with 1985's Live After Death, the new Maiden live set would be released as two separate records. The first, a real live one, containing live versions of their newer hits, featuring material from the band's post Live After Death period, while the second, a real dead one, would feature more vintage classic Maiden songs live. The fans then had a choice of purchasing both albums or just material from either era. A real live one was released in April and instantly made UK number three on the back of the extracted live version of Fear of the Dark, which had already debuted at number eight in the UK singles chart. With the release of the first concert album, a real live one, the band then prepared for the real live tour, their final global trek with singer Bruce Dickinson. At the same time, Maiden set to work on the almost impossible task of finding a suitable replacement for him. They invited anyone up for the job to send a tape, biography and photo to their management, Sanctuary Music. Needless to say, they were flooded with thousands of tapes, CDs and videos from the hopeful to the hopeless. Throughout the spring and summer of 1993, Dickinson and Maiden made their fond farewells as the real live tour went on to complete some 44 shows across Europe. The band visited Moscow for the first time and received an amazing reception from their happy Russian headbanging fans. 
singer Bruce Dickinson was eventually given a suitably grisly send-off at the end of Raising Hell. This was a global, live, pay-per-view, televised magic and musical spectacular featuring TV magician Simon Drake performing grisly tricks interspersed with live footage by the band. The show included Drake playing a guitar solo alongside guitarist Dave Murray with severed hands and Dickinson being decapitated. As the band, now minus Dickinson, got down to the tricky business of sitting down and sifting through the myriad of demos sent to them from prospective singers, the fall of 1993 saw the release of Maiden's second live performance set, A Real Dead One, which made UK number 12. A live version of the Maiden classic, Hallowed Be Thy Name, entered the UK top 10. To further thank their loyal fan base, November saw the release of a supplementary live record, their second live album release in three weeks, Live at Donington, which charted for a week at UK number 23. After an intensive search, it was announced in January 1994 that Dickinson's successor and Maiden's new vocalist was to be Blaze Bailey of UK rockers Wolfsbane. Spain. The band and Bailey had previously crossed paths when Wolfsbane had supported Iron Maiden on their 1990 UK tour. To his advantage, the band had already had the opportunity to see the singer in action and knew what he was capable of live. Despite having been swamped from all over the world by many notable offers, from the start Bailey had been the bookie's favourite to fill Bruce Dickinson's shoes. After listening to all the tapes and holding auditions, no one had cropped up to compete with a Wolfsbane man. Maiden simply felt he was the most suitable candidate for the job. While the new look Iron Maiden lineup set about a period of intensive rehearsals in preparation for the recording of a new album, all the hoopla of Bailey's joining soon died down. Metal media attention turned over to former band crooner Bruce Dickinson, who had now embarked on a fully-fledged solo career. With his second solo album, Balls to Picasso, making the UK Top 30 in the summer of 1994, Dickinson ably filled the void left vacant by the Maiden Men. Having two well-charting Top 40 British hit singles in the shape of Tears of the Dragon and Shoot All the Clowns only furthered his cause. When the former Maiden vocalist took his band over to war-torn Bosnia to play a gig at the Bosnian Cultural Centre in Sarajevo in December 1994, the focal point of attention didn't seem to be Maiden anymore but their ex-singer. It wasn't until October 1995 that Iron Maiden returned to the fray. Dickinson's replacement, Blaze Bailey, marked his debut with the band when the blistering Man on the Edge peaked at number 10 in the UK singles chart. When its parent album, The X Factor, a darkly smouldering affair, eventually hit the streets, it was pretty obvious that Blaze and the band had come up with one of the best Maiden records in years. Iron Maiden not only had a new singer, but also a new producer. For the first time since 1980, a Maiden studio album had not been produced or co-produced by Martin Birch. Since the mid-1980s, Birch had been in semi-retirement, only returning to the mixing desk for Maiden records. When he decided to completely retire, it was decided that bassist Steve Harris would share the producer's chair with Nigel Green. Green had originally been the tape operator on The Killers and the Number of the Beast albums, and had since gone on to become a top-flight producer in his own right. Recorded at Harris Barnyard Studios, with Green co-producing, the new Maiden record had taken well over a year to complete. Their first album since 1982 without Dickinson, it was important that every step was taken to ensure that everything was just right. While the record failed to chart as well as some of its predecessors, especially in the States where it failed even to dent the Hot 100 albums, it was still a success on home turf, where it reached UK number 8 thanks in part to Maiden's live reputation. The X Factor had started prior to the album launch in October 1995, taking in shows in many new territories. The tour opened with dates in Israel and South Africa, the band's first time in both countries. They were also supposed to play in Beirut, but the Lebanese government withdrew their visas and even intervention through diplomatic channels failed to change their minds. Maiden took advantage of the unexpected lull to fly back to the UK to do MTV's Most Wanted. 
They then flew to Romania behind the former Iron Curtain to undertake their first comprehensive tour of Eastern Europe, including dates in Bulgaria, Slovenia, Hungary, Poland, the Czech Republic and Romania. They also toured comprehensively in Western Europe and the UK, highlighted by the band's London Brixton Academy show, before they continued on to the US, Japan and South America, where they headlined many major festivals, including the Monsters of Rock in Sao Paulo in front of 50,000 fans. Any doubts as to Blaze Bailey's ability and the fans' reaction were laid to rest as the band received a warm welcome from all Maiden devotees, especially at home. The Brixton show in particular showcased one of the band's best ever live performances. Well, what's happening, of course, is that, I mean, you can't keep demand down and the fact is is that there is a huge pent-up demand um, for this kind of music uh, and but but people you know it takes a while because people have got you know day jobs and things to do they don't spend 24 hours their working lives thinking you know I must single-handedly you know revive the kind of music I'd like to hear of an evening you know deep purple is not a dirty word and neither is Marillion and neither is you know Iron Maiden and Judas Priest and these kinds of bands. The mid-1990s proved to be a period of uncertainty for Iron Maiden. While they'd made a critically acclaimed return to the metal scene with a new vocalist, their commercial standing, especially in America, wasn't as solid as it had been with Bruce Dickinson. For his part, the former Maiden singer had now formed his own band by the name of Skunk Works and was even performing classic Maiden songs live in his own right. However, despite his past credentials, Dickinson's third solo effort, the self-titled Skunk Works album, along with the extracted Back From The Edge single, failed to dent the UK Top 40 in the spring of 1996. For their part, Iron Maiden needed to recover lost ground. September 1996 saw them back in the charts with a new studio track, Virus, which made UK number 16. It was specially recorded for inclusion as a bonus cut on a double Iron Maiden compilation album released by EMI in October, entitled Best of the Beast. 20 years after they had formed, Iron Maiden was still a musical force to be reckoned with. They had yet another top 20 album on their hands. Dickinson, for his part, counteracted in May 1997 by ditching the band idea and returning under his own name with a Maiden-esque solo offering, Accident of Birth, which featured ex-Maiden guitarist Adrian Smith and an album cover by original Maiden artist Derek Riggs. Again, album and album entitled single track failed to ignite the charts, even though at the time the singer was stinting as a DJ on KLCX Radio, a station broadcasting from Pete Waterman's Manchester Studios. It was pretty obvious that a return to classic Maiden values was called for. By March 1998, Iron Maiden were ready to promote a new studio record, their second with vocalist Blaze Bailey. Previewing the new record, the first single, The Angel and the Gambler, smashed into the UK charts at number 18 in its week of entry. The accompanying amazing video featured the band and their mascot, Eddie, placed in a completely computer-generated environment. Some two decades after their very first recordings, April 1998 saw the release of the song's parent UK Top 20 charting album, Virtual Eleven, aptly named, it being Maiden's 11th studio record. The cover artwork, again supplied by Melvin Grant, depicted a boy watching a football match through a virtual reality headset while being surrounded by Armageddon and the longtime mascot Eddie. A concept album of sorts in the same vein as 1988's Seventh Son of a Seventh Son. Virtual Eleven had a futuristic theme, with the band making their own comments on the dangers of technology and the concern society shared as we approached the new millennium. This sentiment was also reflected in the material on the record, with tracks such as Future Real and When Two Worlds Collide. Maiden, always being massive football supporters, decided to promote the album launch with their own football tour, 1998 being World Cup year. 
the band set to work on putting together a dream team of world professionals, such as Paul Gascoigne, Ian Wright, Faustino Asparilla, Mark Overmars, Patrick Vieira and Stuart Pearce, Pearce being an immense Iron Maiden fan. A virtual 11 team which featured ex-England stalwarts Terry Butcher, Tony Woodcock, Neil Webb and Paul Mariner toured through Europe playing games against teams with similarly famous names like Anders Limpar in Sweden, Gentili and Altobelli in Italy and even meeting up with the great Eusebio in Portugal. On the musical front, their successful nine-month virtual world tour saw Maiden taking dates in Europe, Japan, North America and South America. In late 1998, Bruce Dickinson again teamed up with ex-Maiden guitar man Adrian Smith for his fifth solo effort, The Chemical Wedding. Although it was arguably Dickinson's best record to date, it again failed to light commercial touch paper. Reality for both camps dawned when in January 1999, Iron Maiden were forced to rethink their position. While the band's last two studio albums had performed respectably at home, little interest in the Virtual Eleven album internationally, especially in the US, where it had only reached number 124 in the charts, played a major factor in prompting Blaze Bailey's termination. With the amicable departure of Bailey, the return of both former singer Bruce Dickinson and former guitarist Adrian Smith to record a new album and announce a forthcoming tour brought a new twist to the Maiden tale. In a fashionable new financial move, Iron Maiden issued share certificates against its back catalogue, raising some $30 million in bond issues. In the spring of 1999, Iron Maiden released their long-awaited Ed Hunter game. A double package coupled with another greatest hits album from the band, this time featuring tracks chosen by the Maiden fan base. A full scale reunion world tour ensued in July, featuring the classic Maiden lineup. But this time around, with both Yannick Gares and Adrian Smith in the frame, the band were now a six piece with a formidable three pronged guitar onslaught. With the recent release of a brand new album, New State of Mind, and a top 10 single under their belts with The Wicker Man, Iron Maiden's 2000 reunion world tour has continued unabated with a return to home territory for a large-scale arena show at London Earl's Court. But then, what's so unusual about that? Iron Maiden are a household name in every part of the world. After almost 25 years and almost 50 million album sales, the band are now rightly regarded as the classic British rock band in every sense of the word and are modern masters of a most emotionally extreme and technically dazzling form of rock music. Along the way, despite a variety of lineup changes, the quintessential Maiden sound, the rumbling earth bass, searchlight guitars, spattergun drums and lion's roar vocals has remained mercifully undimmed. As we enter the new millennium, metal is currently enjoying a worldwide resurgence in popularity and Maiden are once again in the vanguard. And that's where they intend to stay for many more years to come. Thanks for buying Maximum Maiden. We hope you enjoyed it. Watch out for further titles on Chrome Dreams coming up soon. If you did enjoy it or have any comments or suggestions, write to us at Chrome Dreams, PO Box 230, New Malden, Surrey, UK, KT36YY, or email on mail at chromedreams.co.uk. For more details on joining the Maximum Collectors Club and claiming your free CDs, check out our website at www chromedreams.co.uk or look at the booklet inside this CD. Thanks again for listening and goodbye for now.